Climate change has been a hot topic now for a very long time. And it's easy to get a bit bored of the topic. And also to think that there'll be some technology that is going to sort the problem out for us sometime out in the future. Or just that it's, you know, it's up to governments to sort this out and we don't have a role to play. Well, I'm lucky enough to work in an interdisciplinary climate change research centre where over the years it's become clear to me that whether you're an economist or an engineer, a social scientist or a physicist, Actually, we need this whole range of perspectives because no single discipline is going to come up with a silver bullet to sort, sort out the climate change problem. So what I want to talk to you today about is this range of perspectives and how that comes together in our thinking from my research group, but also how we all have a role to play. And we all, I think, have some responsibility as well. So brief, briefly, just touching on some of the basics, this graph here is of our CO2 emissions from fossil fuel and energy use. And it shows from the pre-industrial times out to the present day. And it's quite quick to, to see from this uh, graph that emissions have been growing exponentially. Now, the problem with that is that these emissions are accumulating in our atmosphere. So CO2 lasts a long time. From the uh, lights in our room at the moment, we've got this CO2 accumulating. And that means that the longer we've been industrializing, the more this CO2 has gathered in our atmosphere. But what's easy to forget is that when we go about our everyday lives, we're just releasing CO2 all the time. So if you're living in a relatively wealthy country, when you wake up in the morning, perhaps you switch off an electric alarm clock. You go into the bathroom, you go and have a shower, there's hot water. Perhaps that's coming from being heated by gas. You maybe even brush your teeth with an electric toothbrush. You go downstairs, you put the kettle on, more electricity. You go to the fridge, maybe get some milk for your breakfast, more electricity. Eventually, you might walk out the door. You might get on the bus to school or to work. You might get into a car, petrol, diesel, doesn't really matter. All of these things are contributing CO2 emissions just as we go about our everyday lives. And it doesn't stop there because every product we buy, so every little gadget that we have, has embedded CO2 within it. And so it doesn't matter whether that was produced in the UK or whether it was manufactured overseas, it's highly unlikely that that product will have been made with energy that was from a low carbon source. So it's all around us, it's just being produced throughout our everyday lives. And it accumulates. So a lot of the CO2 that you and I have already released in our lifetimes is sticking with us in the atmosphere. Because while the oceans and the land absorb some of that CO2, a lot of it is still remaining. And that's why we're getting an increase in temperatures, because CO2 is a greenhouse gas. So since the Industrial Revolution over time, the more countries that have got involved in industrialization, the more CO2 has built in our atmosphere. And then those countries that industrialize first have actually ended up contributing more because those emissions have had chance to accumulate for much longer. So if we look at different countries around the world and we try to compare them in terms of this cumulative CO2 because of greenhouse gases being long-lived, if you look at the red bars here, these are split by different areas of the world. And we've got the total cumulative CO2. Now, for North America, this is from the 1960s. In North America, it's about eight times more cumulative CO2 than the entire continent of Africa. But we need to dig a little bit deeper because, because actually countries are just a function of where we happen to have our geographical boundaries and the numbers of people that actually live in them. And it is somewhat arbitrary. So we need to focus perhaps more on the per capita emissions. And in terms of per capita CO2, North America has produced about 15 times more per person to the contribution of climate change than the average African. Now, you could also argue, well, we didn't really understand climate change all that much in the 1960s. But we have really understood it very well since the 1990s, and that's the time since which we've been having these annual meetings, like the meeting coming up in Paris. And even since the 1990s, per capita emissions from North America are about 13 times more contribution than Africa. And for us in the EU, we're about eight times more per person than the average African. So you can see that there's a big disparity in the contribution to climate change. So from the perspective of the average African, They've contributed very little to the climate change problem. 
And yet, as a relatively poor country with relatively poor infrastructure and support networks on average, these countries like Africa and other poorer parts of the world are going to be the ones that are most significantly impacted by climate change. And so I want to talk about this issue of climate change, how we do something about the climate change problem and also just reflect a little bit on this meeting that's coming up in Paris. So the Paris meeting in November, December is focused on avoiding climate change but it has a particular goal in mind that you might have heard talked about in the media, and that's to avoid a two degree temperature rise above pre-industrial levels. So let's just focus on what two degrees means because we need to break that number down and see what that tells us in terms of our policies, in terms of our CO2 emissions. And I want to talk and focus particularly on this issue of cumulative CO2 emissions. So the graph behind me shows the CO2 emissions per year from 1990 in this pink trajectory out to the date that we've got the latest data available. Now the concern from scientists and engineers and other people who understand how economies are growing around the world is that we're currently more on track for a four degree centigrade rise than the two degrees that we're trying to avoid. Now, I'm just going to pause for a moment and think about four degrees, because does that sound like it means anything to you? I think average temperatures can sound a little bit meaningless. Most of our planet is made up of the sea. The sea has a greater thermal inertia than the land, which means that the average temperatures on the land are going to be greater. Secondly, we don't experience global average temperatures. We experience hot days or cold days or wet days or stormy days. And so under this climate change, under a four degree scenario, what we're actually talking about is if you imagine the hottest day that you've ever experienced. Now, you're not on a beach, you're actually in a city center, even hotter, sticky, horrible. Sun beating down, perhaps there's concrete and glass all around you. Now imagine that six, eight, maybe even 10 or 12 degrees warmer. That's the kind of extreme that you get on a four degree global average temperature change. And our infrastructure is just not set up to be, to be dealing with these sorts of extremes because it comes with other events such as um, storm events and so on. And so we need to be considering what four degrees as an average means in terms of our entire uh, setup as we have at the moment. And there are other indirect effects as well. So things like food security. Under a four degree type scenario, we're talking about reductions in yields in, in staple crops like maize and wheat and rice of 30 or 40% in some parts of the world. That will be absolutely devastating for food security. And so there are quite a lot of people when they start to look at this four degree scenario, which we've focused on less than two degrees, that this looks incompatible with global organized living. So back to our two degree target, can we still can we still keep our temperatures below it? Well, a lot of people actually think that it's too late. I still think we've got still a small fighting chance, but we really need to get to grips with the numbers to work out how to do that. So I want to focus on this immediate period that's just, this is now, this yellow circle, because you see that the departure between the four degree trajectory and the two degree trajectory is effectively immediately. And that's because it's the cumulative emissions that matter, because they stay with us. These emissions now from these lights are going to be with us for the next 100 years or so. So we need to focus on the cumulative emissions. Because the problem is if we continue along the four degree, so the red trajectory here, whatever we overshoot our two degree target by needs to be compensated for later, because it's the area under the curve that matters, not where we get to in 2050. So, that has two implications. One is that our red line you'll see is steeper than the green. That means that those emission reductions year on year have to be greater for the same climate outcome. And we also might need to have even deeper emission reductions in future. It also tells us something about our energy policies. Because if we want to actually reduce CO2 emissions in the short term, then with all the will in the world, the large-scale infrastructure to decarbonize our electricity, our heat, our transport networks is not going to be rolled out at the scale that we need um, in, the, in the next few years. It's going to take a number of decades. In the meantime, we need to be focusing on energy conservation, energy efficiency, using less energy. Of course, we need to be decarbonizing our energy supply, and we're already starting to do that, but the savings are going to come later. Another important issue is the issue of equity that I've already touched upon. So for many parts of the world, economies need to grow to improve standards of living and well-being. But if we're constrained by the same amount of carbon 
in the whole world, then those countries where emissions need to grow and, and have increases in emissions means that the wealthier nations need to reduce their emissions even more. And some of the research that I've done with my colleague Kevin Anderson at the Tyndall Centre indicates that emission reductions of wealthy countries like the UK would need to reduce emissions immediately and at an, of an order of 10% per year. Now, to put that into perspective, the economist Nicholas Stern suggested that emission reductions of more than 1% per year have only ever been associated with economic recession or upheaval. Now, that's not to say that I want to bring about economic recession or upheaval, but I think it does pose very significant questions for our economists to think about. But it also opens up a really important agenda for researchers and scientists and engineers and social scientists because we need to focus on radical mitigation, and I think there are three key elements. Technology, how far and how fast can we push existing, not necessarily new, technology to bring about change? A focus on who's emitting, because not everyone is going to have to change a high-carbon lifestyle, but probably everybody in this room will. And we need to challenge our obsession with economic growth. Because either we do this and we take the climate change um, challenge seriously, or we significantly risk this higher four-degree type scenario. Because as long as we have our high-carbon infrastructure in place and a conventional approach to policymaking, economic growth is going to be accompanied by a rise in emissions. Now, we have a huge lever that we can pull on the demand side, but we need to work out a way to do it. This isn't talking about moving from one type of light bulb to another. This is about doing things differently. This is about whole system change, step change. Sometimes it's about doing less things. And this applies to all of us. Whatever sphere of influence we have, whether it's interacting with our teachers, whether it's talking to our friends, whether it's if we're in jobs and we have some sort of position where we can make some decisions or influence over our energy use. I get really tired of hearing, oh, it doesn't matter what I do, my emissions don't count, or it doesn't really matter what the UK does because China's emissions are growing so rapidly. But what we can't get away from is the fact that the per capita emissions in countries like ours, and since the 1990s in terms of moral responsibility, are very high. So we need to take a mirror to ourselves. My emissions and your emissions might be a small percentage of global emissions. But together, and through influence and interaction, we actually add up to a great deal more. So if we want to actually tackle the climate change problem, we need to start with ourselves. We need to think about how we can make change, how we can influence. Because if that change doesn't come from within our privileged group, then we're not going to make the transformation necessary to avoid the two-degree target. Thank you. <laughs>